as usual, when you start studying, you know, you think you're going in one direction, and all of a sudden, no, 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 let's move over here. Well, I thought the emphasis was, no, 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 let's go over here. It's, it's your message, Lord, so let's, let's, let's go. Uh, let's just, again, go to the throne. We can't do that enough. Our Father and our God, we praise you. We pray that you bless each one here tonight. We again pray for Melinda and Sophia, that you bless that situation with your mighty hand. We pray that you open our hearts, our minds, our spirits to receive that which you would have us to receive tonight. We pray that your gift of teaching fall upon me and that you help me to step aside, Lord, that nothing be said that is not of you from your word through your Holy Spirit. We give you all the praise and the glory for this in Jesus' name. Loyalty. How many have heard that word? Loyalty. Loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. Aren't you loyal? Aren't you my friend? Aren't you a member of this family? How could you do this? Of course, don't you think of, uh, oops, little echo there. It's, a, it's a, a word that countries go to war over. People get shot over, families get split up over, marriages get, get blown asunder. It's a very, very important word. What does it really mean? Well, we're going to get into some of that tonight. Because chapter 44 is all about it. And it's all about a final test. A final test. It's, I almost title this, Put Your Money Where Your Mouth Is. But I titled the message, Stand By Me, because really that's what this is about. That's exactly what this is about. We've traveled a long way with Joseph. And oh, the focus of this last number of chapters have been on Joseph, everything that he's gone through. We know the story by now. Joseph the young man, Joseph cast into a pit, Joseph beaten and sold as a slave, Joseph going into the house of Potiphar, the Lord blessing, Joseph winding up, standing up for the Lord, standing for his integrity, standing up for his master, being lied about and being cast into prison for years, interpreting dreams to two people, and years later, years later, Pharaoh having a dream, and now, Joseph being called upon from the depths of that prison where he was second man, where he was running things just like he did at Potiphar's house. Now standing in front of Pharaoh. And within the hour standing in front of Pharaoh, he's made the grand vizier, the governor of Egypt. Because something was coming. Seven years of plenty. Seven years of plenty were coming. But after that, Seven years of drought, seven years of, of need and want, and it was worldwide. And through the Lord and through Joseph's obedience, Egypt was ready. Egypt was ready for it. Egypt to put away enough grain to essentially feed the known world and itself. And Joseph was the second man Joseph was the second man in the nation of one of the most powerful nations, arguably the most powerful nation of its time, Egypt. And into this come back Joseph's brothers. And we've traveled with Joseph's brothers. We've seen the violent people that they are. We've seen the lies. We've seen the killing. We've seen the envy and the strife. And here they are again, in front of Joseph, bowing down to Joseph, just like in Joseph's dream. We learned about all this, and here Joseph is. The, he has them in the palm of his hands. And no, 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 no. Joseph's not like that. Joseph hasn't given in to the bitterness, the empty bitterness of vengeance. 
He sees his brothers. He sees the fulfillment of that prophecy. And he sees God working. And so he, obedience is used of God to take a look at this family. Family. Because that's what it is. A dysfunctional family. And let me tell you, brethren, as I was reading these chapters, <laughs> I was just amazed. I said, you know, I thought I came from a dysfunctional family. And believe me, if I get into a lot of the details, you would say, indeed, you have come from a dysfunctional family. But I wanted to ask a question, a candid question. You don't have to put your hand up if you don't want. How many of you come from a dysfunctional family? family. I have a secret for you. All families are dysfunctional. <laughs> they are. Don't be silly about it. We're dysfunctional. I mean, come on. It's just that when you read about Jacob's sons, you really see what this function's about. I mean, you think you're in a dysfunctional family. Look at these guys. I mean, holy mackerel. So I kept saying, yeah, that's dysfunctional. I thought I saw dysfunctional. It's like the old, the old comedy routine. You want to see dysfunctional? I'll show you dysfunctional. And you get into this family, you are looking at dysfunctional. You really are. There's no question about it. And Joseph, instead of being a product of that dysfunction, through the living God, rises above it time and time again. And he's now looking at these ten who are kneeling in front of him, and he is going to be used of God to say, wait a minute. It's been 22 years, or thereabouts. Where are you now? Where are you now? Where is this family now? Because family it is. And they are his brothers, and that means a lot to, to Joseph. It means a lot to God, because I've got news for you. In case you hadn't figured it out, well, please forgive me if I'm saying something that you already know. The family was created by God. The structure was created by God. He created the family. We can get on to all kinds of scripture for, oh, don't, have you not read a man shall leave his womb, cleave to his, and so on and so forth. The family was designed by God. It's important to God. No man, I don't care what the laws, they can ever undo what God has made and designed. If you do that, you're messing with the wrong person. You're messing with, you're messing with something that is not going to be good. Because as dysfunctional as our families are, and as dysfunctional as this family is, it's not the end of the story. It really isn't. And you kind of look at the family, and you look at yourself within that structure of the family, and you have to ask yourself a couple of questions. Who are we within the family? Have we strengthened the family, or have we weakened it? Have we strengthened our marriage? Have we strengthened our family? Have we strengthened our workplace, our coworkers, our employers? Have we strengthened our church, our church family? What about our community? It's all related. It all flows from the family. All of it flows from the family. So let's ask another question. If we haven't strengthened, have we weakened our marriage? Have we weakened our family? Have we weakened our workplace, our coworkers, our employers, our church, our community? If we were to really look at ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves that question, where are we? Have we strengthened? Do we work to strengthen? Or do we weaken? How loyal are we? 
We like to say that we are. Hello, are we same, same, same subject, same, our family, our marriage, our workplace, our coworkers, our employers, our church, our community. Well, those are the questions that Joseph was asking. Because Joseph was willing to test and strengthen his family. He wasn't willing to let it go. He wasn't just going to have his brothers come, and he wasn't just going to have to let them buy food and let them go beyond their way, or imprison them, or, or, or all the other things that could be done in our own human frailties. No. Joseph wanted to test and strengthen his family because Joseph allowed God to direct his actions. And Joseph was not going to stop until the final test or the final question was answered. He wasn't going to do it. He wasn't that kind of man. And so the brothers come to him. And he allows them to buy grain. He certainly doesn't reveal himself, as you know, and as you've learned. And he questions them in depth. He gets answers that he's looking for. He sells them the grain, puts the money back in their sacks, and has one proviso to prove that they're not spies, which he has accused them of. He demands that they, they leave a hostage, and Simeon is left with him. Because when they return, they have to bring their youngest brother. Because he has learned that in his family, his mother, Rebecca, gave birth to Benjamin. And he's never seen him, and he wants to see him. But he's also testing his brothers. So Simeon is kept with him, and the brothers go back. And as I noted last week, nobody mentions Simeon. You don't see anybody saying, hey, by the way, nobody comes back in a, in a hurry to free Simeon. They're, they're, they just eat up the food. And they run out of food, so they got to go back. And so we have the dialogue that we learned last week in chapter 43, they have to go back to Egypt. And Judah reminds Jacob, Israel, hey, we can't go back without Benjamin. And there's a big tussle because you see, again, Jacob is being tested too. Where's your love, Jacob? You say you love your family. Your son Simeon is still imprisoned in Egypt. You need food. You're going to have to risk. You have God's promises. You have God's promises. Do you believe them? So he, yes, he yields, sends his sons down. So back they go. And here they are again in front of Joseph. And we go through all this stuff all over again, and they're bowing and everything else. And now, because they have brought Benjamin, they are invited to Joseph's home. Joseph throws a feast, sees Benjamin, almost breaks down, has to go into another chamber to cry, cleans himself up, goes back, and they have a great time. And the brothers are amazed because they're all seated in birth order. I mean, go figure. They're all seated in birth order. But nobody complains about that. Nobody says, oh, no, no wait a minute. I should, I should be sitting next to and so on and so forth. They all accept it. And then Benjamin gets five times the food that everybody else gets. And you don't hear any complaints. You don't hear one of the brothers say, hey, what gives? How come he gets so much? You don't hear any of that. They're having a great time. And so that night, while they're all asleep, after having a feast and having a good time of fellowship, something happens. During the first trip, Joseph had learned that his father was still alive. He had a younger brother. His brothers had shown sorrow. He learned. They confessed their sin. They confessed their sin against Joseph, the sin of selling him into slavery. They had not repented. 
that they had confessed it. They had shown they were trustworthy, that they were honest, could be trusted. They had shown some loyalty to the family. They had returned to free their brother Simeon now. Here they were. They brought Benjamin with them. It's a big deal. But there were still some steps. Joseph's brothers had to be converted. They had to become committed followers of God. It's not enough to read or know the story. It's not enough to know the Lord. It's not enough to read scripture. You have to commit. You have to commit. They had to become attached to the family of God, really attached, become loyal to the family of believers upon the earth. They had to willingly fulfill God's purpose for their own lives, become the godly leaders. They were going to be the patriarchs of the tribes of Israel, a new nation. And they had to diligently seek the promised land the great hope that God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God used Joseph to lead the brothers to repentance to the point where they would all seek the forgiveness of God and turn their lives over to him to strengthen their concept of Israel or Jacob's family as the chosen family, which God had made promises to, promises that were real, Promises that were important. Promises that meant that they had to adhere to who he was and who they were in him. And God used Joseph to teach the importance of the family. That they themselves were the family chosen to receive the promised land. And the other promises of God, the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's one thing to read scripture. It's one thing to say, we believe. It's one thing to say, oh, I love my wife. I love my children. I love you. I love you, Lord. But what does all that mean? So are we willing? to strengthen our own ties to the family? Are we willing to be more faithful, to be more loving, to be more giving, to be more helpful? Because that's what's required of us, more. You want to know what God wants. He wants more. He wants all of us, 100%. Nothing held back. That's what he wants. And he works. He works through all different things. He works through the family a lot. He works through the trials and tests that we go through. They're not fun. They're not. I haven't even got to the scripture yet. <laughs> Lord help me. Proverbs 23, 22. Listen to your father who begot you and do not despise your mother when she is old. First and foremost mother and father. Ephesians 5, 25. Wives, submit to your own husbands as the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Ephesians 6, 1, 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And, and I couldn't help but throw this one in. Ephesians 6, 4. And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Why is all this stuff in there? It's to teach us how we are supposed to be with each other and our family. And with that, let's go to Genesis 44. 
And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sack with food as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Also put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, and his grain money. So he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away and their, donkey with, and their donkeys. And when they had all gone out of the city and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, Get up. Follow the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is not this the one from which my Lord drinks, and which he indeed practices divination? You have done evil in so doing. So he overtook them, and he spoke to them these same words, and they said to him, Why does my Lord say these words? Far be it from us that your servants should do such a thing. Look, we brought you back to, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? With whomever of your servants it is found, let them die or let him die, and we also will be my Lord's slaves. Joseph creates the final test. They bought the food, they've had their night's rest, and during the night, Joseph has had his steward put their money right back into each one of their sacks, and also he gives them a silver cup, his divination, I say that in quotes, and puts it into the mouth of the sack belonging to Benjamin, and off they go, and then you've heard, he instructs, this steward, this is what you're going to do. Go chase them, and you're going to make an accusation. You are going to make an accusation. And that accusation is going to stun them. And let's see what they do when you make that accusation. And that's exactly what the steward does. But listen to what the brothers say when the accusation is made. And they said to him, verse 7, and they said to him, why does my Lord say these words? Far be it from us that your servants should do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which was found in the mouth of our sacks. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? With whomever of your servants it is found, let him die, and we also will be my Lord's slaves. They believe, hey, we didn't do this. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, we didn't do this. But notice what they say, whoever did this should die, and the rest of us will become slaves. If you, no, you're not gonna find anything, go ahead, look. It's not gonna happen, we didn't do that. We brought the money back, come on, we, we wouldn't do such a thing. We wouldn't. Well, it's really interesting. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You all know the scripture. Some of you, some of us, sometimes have looked at our families, children, brothers, people who believe, and all of a sudden, they're going off on a curve. They're going off on a tangent. They're moving in a direction. And you're going, huh. Oh my Lord, what are we going to do now? What? Oh Lord, this is, this is my son, my daughter, my friend, my brother. What do I do, Lord? And then you rely on the scripture, especially for your children, because it says train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. It doesn't say that he's not going to depart from it, or he's not going to have, or he or she are not going to have difficulty getting there. It doesn't say that they're not going to take tangents. It doesn't say that you're not going to have aggravation. It's not, it doesn't say that they're not going to stumble or make mistakes or go off and Lord knows what. But it says when they are old, they'll come back. They'll remember. They'll remember the training. They'll remember the words. They'll remember the love. They'll remember me, and I'll take care of it. It's a tough one to hang on to sometimes. But our God is 
Now, it's really funny. You've heard it taught from here that sometimes when you get into an argument with somebody, somebody might say the words, you've changed. You're not as much fun as you used to be. Why is it all so heavy with you? Why is everything so serious with you? Why do you always have to bring Jesus in on everything? And so on and so forth. I don't know if you've ever heard that. I've changed. I hope so. I've changed. I want to keep changing. I don't want to stand still. I don't want this to be the end of it. I want to keep growing. I want to keep getting used. I want to know our Lord more, serve him more, walk with him in a deeper and richer way. Uh, that doesn't mean I don't have a sense of humor, I hope. But yeah, there are things that are very, very serious. There are things that we just don't let slide anymore because we're different. Look at the difference that we've seen in these 10 men from the beginning of this journey together. Remember what they were. Remember what they did. Remember each one of them. And look at them now. They're brought back to Joseph. But no one said, because remember, they opened up the sacks. <laughs> Verse 8. Again, look, we brought you back. We brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks. How could we steal silver or gold from the Lord's house? And then so go ahead and look. Whoever of your servants that is found, let him die, and we also will be my Lord's slaves. And he said, Now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave, and you shall be blameless. Then each man speedily let down his sack to the ground, and each opened his sack. And so he searched, and he began with the oldest and left off with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. Now that's a verse, verse 13. Then they tore their clothes, and each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. That's an important verse. Because the silver cup was found in Benjamin's sack. And these 10 guys did not say, well, I don't know how it got there, Ben, but good luck. See ya. Let me know how that works out. We're heading back to her. They didn't do that. They didn't do that. Ben, what could you do? How could you do something like this? Psh, brother, you're in for it. Good luck. They didn't do that. They tore their clothes in anguish, and they all loaded their donkeys up, and they went back, all of them went back. This is not the same group of guys who we met 22 years ago. They had their food. They even must have found their money back. Nobody said anything about that. No, they just loaded their donkeys back after, after showing anguish, and went back with Benjamin. 14, so Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, and he was still there. And they fell before him on the ground, and Joseph said to them, what deed is this you have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice divination? Let's clarify that just a little bit here, okay? The silver cup that he gave him was called a divination cup. And in that culture, what you did when you, when you were well fixed, 
is you practice divination. You're expected as an officer of the court or someone who had very, very high rank to, especially someone who can interpret dreams, practice divination. So that cup was probably a gift of Pharaoh, and he was expected to have it. So the custom was that you would namely, you take, take that cup, you would pour oil or water in it, and then you would see whatever shapes came out, you would read the shapes, and that's how you practice divination. Now, does that mean that Joseph was practicing divination? No, it does not mean that Joseph was practicing divination. Joseph was hatching a very, very interesting and intricate plan here. Now, let's think about this. He took something that was important, and he called it his cup of divination, and he put it into Benjamin's sack. That brought them back. Why do you think that Joseph put the gold back into his brother's sack? Think about it. Because it gave him another plan. Let's say for the sake of argument that the brothers had turned around and said, well, Ben, good luck. We're out of here. You take care. Well, then Joseph had a reason to have them arrested because they had the gold in their sacks. So no matter which way it was going to work, they were going back before Joseph. It just depended on how they went back. But they didn't do that. They didn't desert Benjamin. They came back willingly. They stood with him. The brothers stood together. They declared their honesty. They'd return. They'd come in with Benjamin. They'd come in with the money that they had in their sacks from last time. They gave, they gave gifts. They brought Benjamin. They, they were there for Simeon. Why would they steal silver? Why would they steal that cup now or, or steal any of their gold? They declared their willingness to stand together as a family. We are a family. We're here with Benjamin. No, they didn't desert him. No, they didn't. And they were confident of their innocence. That's one of the reasons they said, go ahead, search, search. They even said, look, wherever you find it, go, you'll execute that one and we'll become your slaves. This is, again, not this, this isn't the same group of guys. They changed. They truly changed. But Joseph was not practicing divination. Because the other point that he was making with all this is to say, you can't hide anything from me. You can't hide anything from me. Don't you know that? I can see everything that you do, right? Then, in verse 16, Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Here we are, my Lord's slaves, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. Judah steps up. Judah is the one who steps forward. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And there they were. The brothers were standing together in front of Joseph. No, 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 nobody was saying, hey, well, oh, and there weren't any finger. No, no, no. No. We stand here, and Judah stepped up. God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Here we are, my Lord, slaves, both we and he, and also with whom the cup was found. Oh, I don't know how this happened, but we're guilty. But he said, far be it from me that I should do so. And this is Joseph now. 
No, 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 I'm not going to punish all of you. No, no, I'm not going to punish all of you. Far be it from me that I should do so. The man in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. And as for you, go up in peace to your father. He's letting them off the hook. He's letting them off the hook. Last temptation. Here. No, 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 no. He's the one who's guilty. I'm not going to try to punish all of you. I'm not going to punish the innocent as well as the guilty. No, 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 no. Benjamin will stay. Benjamin is guilty. He I will keep as my sleeve. The rest of you can go home to your dad. Philippians 1.27 Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. These were not the same men. They were not the same men. I mean think of it. Think about this. Where they were, where they are now, they did not desert Benjamin. They did not desert him. They were given the opportunity, but they did not. They were willing to place themselves in harm's way for their brother. And they freely returned to face whatever consequences would befall their brother together. First Peter 3.8, please. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. This chapter sp spoke to me in a way that I just didn't expect it to. I mean, I know the story. I've read it I don't know how many times. This family came together. God worked in this family the intervening years. These brothers had learned. They had learned, they had allowed God to work in their lives. They lived with the sin for 22 years and it gnawed at them, it ate at them, it ate at their very fabric. And you can't help but see in what you're seeing now and what we're reading now that this family started praying to God, started recognizing who he was, started seeing the miserable characters that they were. And they came together when push came to shove, and they stood as a family. They stood as a family. Finally, all of you being of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous. It's speaking to us. So Joseph's final test, his final test, are you really ready to stand together? Do you truly love one another? What does that love mean? What shape does that love take? Are you the same crowd of guys who I knew 22 years ago? Really? If you've changed, how real is that change? Are you willing to take one for the team? I know that sounds kind of funny. I couldn't think of any other way to put it something that we would understand. Are we willing to stand up for what's right? Are we willing to put ourselves in harm's way for those we love and take it? Are we? Does that include sharing their faith, or maybe having a faith that's worse than they would be facing because you've done it. So Judah steps up. Of all people, Judah steps up. Verse 18, then Judah came near to him and said, O Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing. 
and do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age who is young. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father. For if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. Joseph steps up, and he reminds Joseph of his question regarding their family, asking if they had a brother or a father. And they answered honestly. He reminded Joseph of their father, that their father was old and had two other sons. One was, son was dead, and the other son was the child of his father's old age. And their father loved him dearly. You notice they're not, they're not Judah's not throwing this out for his benefit. He's explaining to Joseph, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. Our father loves this young man. You ask us to bring him back. You ask us to do these things. You were the one who made the demands. We met these demands. And our father's back there waiting for him to come back now. So he reminded Joseph of his demand to bring Benjamin to Egypt to prove that they were telling the truth. And he reminded Joseph of their caution and, and hesitance in bringing Benjamin in the first place. But they did. They came. Here they were. But he's talking also about his father. And we said, verse 20, and we said to my Lord, we have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age who is young. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children. And his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father. For if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. So it was when, my, when we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go back and buy us a little food. But we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down, for we may not see the, young man, the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore to me Excuse me, you know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. But if you take this one also from me, and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. You'll kill me. If anything happens to Benjamin, you'll kill me. You'll kill me. I'll die. I can't do it twice. So Judah pleads his case. He tells him how the need for more food arose. He, he, he recounts to him all these things. How the sons reminded their father of the demand of, the governor, of, of Joseph, the governor. The youngest had to go with him, and he told Joseph of their father's response. His wife had borne him two sons, and one had been torn to pieces. Isn't that interesting? And one had been torn to pieces. Imagine Joseph standing there hearing this story, and one had been torn to pieces. Really? You have to wait for the next chapter. Mm. Oh, really? But he also told him how Jacob, their father, feared losing the second son. That it would kill him. It would kill him. You see, their father's life was closely bound up with Benjamin, just like it had been with Joseph. Israel would die if Benjamin was not with them when they returned home. The sons, the servants of Joseph, would therefore be guilty of killing their father. 
because they did not bring their brother Benjamin home. This they would not do. They couldn't do it again. They wouldn't do it again. And the proof of it was that they were all standing before Joseph with Benjamin. Think of it. Think of that. Think of how Joseph must have felt when he saw his brothers, all his brothers back. And the steward told him, no, 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 no. They all came willingly. There was no, you didn't need to go to plan B here with the gold. They all came willingly. Just think of it. They've changed. They've changed. They're not the same men. The proof of it is here. Here they are. And Judah steps up. Judah steps up. We, read, we knew about Judah. We heard about Judah. Remember Judah? He steps up. This is not the same Judah. It's not the same Judah we saw in Genesis 37, who didn't keep his promises, who left his family, who always took the lesser of two evils, and who was so quick to condemn because it was convenient for him to condemn. No, no, no. This was a different Judah standing here. This was a Judah standing in front of the authority of the Grand Vizier pleading his case. This was, wow. Verse 29, but if you take this one also from me and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Now, therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, how a father with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me? lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father. Take me. Take me. Take me. And in that moment, in that moment, Judah became the patriarch of the line of David, the seed of our Lord Jesus Christ because he became an example of our Lord Jesus Christ. Take me. Take me. Let my brothers go. Take me. Wow. Judah offered to become the substitute for Benjamin, to accept the punishment for ben do Benjamin, to bear the guilt for Benjamin, to suffer on behalf of Benjamin to give his life for the life of Benjamin. He pointed the way. God used him. God used Joseph and worked in the entire family. These were not the same men. What, what a story. These were not the same men. Same God. Same God. Our Lord Jesus Christ has come, and we know him. We cannot be the same. We cannot. You know, families are a royal pain, but you know what? I'll bet you every one of you, hopefully, 
every one of you, can look back at your families as imperfect as they are and see that they came through in certain circumstances. Not always, not always in the way we'd liked, but as imperfect as they are. Family is important. The structure that God gave us is the family. The structure of the church is a family. I think we can just go to John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Galatians 5, 13, 15. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Do we strengthen the family? Do we weaken it? Do we go with the word of God and what he means. And this chapter 44 is incredible if you stop to think about it. Look at the changes. Look at what we've seen. Look who these brothers are now. They're the patriarchs. They're not the same. We have to be able to say the same. We're not the same. No, we're not because we know the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior, and we are not the same. And we have a family. This is the family that we're gonna be worshiping with. This is the family that we're gonna have when we get up there. And we can demonstrate it here out of love for him. who stood in our place. Wow. Stood in my place. I don't know that I can say anything else except that I feel that the Lord is working here but we have to let him work. We have to let him work in each of our lives. And we have to be diligent. And we have to be strong. And we have to get outside, get outside of ourselves and get out of his way. And let him work. And he'll show the way. And he will, because he's our God and he doesn't change. We may. And he doesn't move away from us we move away from him. So we can't let that happen. We can't let that happen. We take this exa these examples. Look at these. We may have brothers, sisters, friends who we are praying for. Look at these guys. Look where they started. Look where they are now, standing in front of Joseph, standing together as a family. Wow. That's God at work. That's our God. And he's at work just as much today as ever. So let's get out of his way. Let him work. Let's be family. Let's strengthen and not weaken. Let's grow. Let's go. Our God is great. Our God is awesome. And now when we serve a risen Christ, he's alive. And God knows the day's coming that we're going to be with him. So let's make our time here count for him. For him. And for love of him. And for all that he's done for us.
Let's pray. Oh, Father and our God, oh, Lord, you are awesome. You are so awesome. There's none before you, Lord, nor will there be any after you, and all glory is yours. Lord, we, Lord, we read these words with joy. What work you have done, what work you are doing, Lord God, what work you are going to do. Help us, guide us, strengthen us, deepen us in our walk, clear our path, remove the barriers, and help us, Lord, to look to you, to look to you. We pray through your mercy and through your love and grace that you pour fresh winds in our sails, that you give us a fresh indwelling of, of your Holy Spirit, that you strengthen us in our walk, guide us in our steps, and that, Lord, in love we serve you and each other through you and your word. We give you all the praise and the glory for this, and we ask these things in the name and under the authority of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Pastors and elders are here in front. Please, come to the throne. Pray. Seek his face. He's doing a mighty work, and he's not going to let us down.